so yeah kind of continuing uh in the, the vein of, of john's talk um i'm going to be talking about world number um and everything quantum mechanics so um sort of jump straight in so um in a nutshell so um whilst most proponents of the sort of contemporary decoherence based eqm um acknowledge the indeterminacy of world number um I kind of propose that this discussion is often underdeveloped um, and you know, largely unsatisfying. Um, so the point of departure for this talk is to firstly consider in more detail why the standard uh, standard response is inadequate, and then um, secondly to suggest that how a more uh, illuminating uh, explanation of indeterminacy uh, must first acknowledge the distinction between the, the world uh, or imminent representation, as I call it, um, of an Everett world, so that's the representation of an Everett world from within an Everett world, uh, and then the representation of an Everett world at the level um, at which all Everett worlds come into view, um, so a representation I call the multiverse representation. Um, I'll use branch and world interchangeably, but um, predominantly use the term worlds as I think it's kind of more apt given the kind of uh, the theme and the claims of the paper. Um, so here, I mean, just to kind of rehearse what we, we've already uh, been through. So um, I'm going to be working with decoherence based EQM. Um, so on, on this view, quantum theory is understood without perhaps the wave function. Um, fundamental reality consists of all quantum possibilities and uh, Everett worlds are not defined at the microscopic level at all. So they're all emergent, stru emergent structures um, to be understood using methods sort of central to accounts of emergence in the physical sciences more broadly. Um, this, I take it, generates at least some space for how can, counting the number of worlds may prove problematic. So um, consider an analogy of the number of clouds in the sky. So how many clouds are in the sky? Or alternatively, which collections of, of wisps constitute a, um, a cloud? So the... Um, the situation in Everett is slightly different. So Everett worlds result from the discretization of configuration space, but different coarse grainings uh, of the decoherence basis give uh, different enumerations of worlds. So if the partition is chosen at particularly fine grain, we get more worlds will be counted than if the partition is chosen at a coarser grain. Um, but the choice of grain is not without uh, limits, however. So if the description is either too coarse grained or too fine grained, then the decoherence conditions cease to be met and there's no precise point at which these conditions occur. Um, so we can kind of identify two related strands, basically, to the, to the difficulties we face in, in discussions of world number. So firstly, on the one hand, world number is sensitive to the coarse graining of the decoherence basis. So different coarse grainings um, deliver different enumerations of worlds. And then secondly, there's no precise point at which this disc discretization is too fine grained or too coarse grained. So there's no precise demarcation um, of worlds. So at kind of either end, if you like. So there's no precise minimum or maximum grain, which is to count as an Everett world. Um, okay, so how many worlds are there? Um, whilst many authors address the issue of world number, the explanation is never quite... Uh, straightforward. So um, most discussions agree that the question how many worlds there's a presumption that isn't compatible with the Everettian framework, um, but authors' responses vary to some degree. So here's Simon Saunders um, suggesting that the question how many worlds has no good answer. Um, also, counts of worlds are instead arbitrary conventions. Uh, elsewhere, he claims the number of worlds is not part of what is really there. Um, Slightly earlier, Greaves suggests, uh, Hilary Greaves suggests world number is not well defined. Um, Wallace, uh, writing 2010, suggests the number of worlds ultimately fails to make sense. Um, and then Al, writing more recently, kind of in response to most of these suggestions, um, denies that the question is nonsensical, but acknowledges that there's something defective about it. So. Um, he incorporates this term um, bivalently indeterminate. So there is some n such that n is the number of worlds, but there is no such n that n is determinately the number of worlds. Um, so there is a kind of, um, despite the variation, there's a consensus to these responses. So um, we can agree that there is something defective about the question, 
um, that no world count is either physically or metaphysically privileged, um, that there's no finest grain description or coarsest grain description, um, and that world count is uh, indeterminate. Um, but I think there's still a, a kind of problem here. So if the world around us is an Everett world, as the theory suggests, then the consensus view is kind of deeply uh, unsettling, at least I think. So how, do, how does the world we see around us fit into a structure of which there are an indeterminate number of them? Um, so in other words, how do we reconcile the Everett world we see around us with the fact that there are an indeterminate number of Everett worlds? Um, okay. So there's this notion of our world or this world that's often crops up. Um, so let me in introduce this notion. Um, again, Al uh, Wilson suggests that Everett worlds um, are worlds like this one, just more things of the same general sort. Uh, later, um, he suggests the one and only Everett world um, that we ourselves occupy. Um, Similarly, in uh, Wallace, so Wallace suggests uh, these worlds are constantly splitting into multiple versions of themselves. Our own world is just one amongst this multitude. So prima facie, it then kind of looks like there's a determinately one world of which we inhabit, but an indeterminate number of them. Um, or to put the point slightly different, differently, whilst it seems there's a determinate fact about the world we inhabit, to the extent that we can count this world as one world, how do we get from this fact that we count this world as one world to the fact of there being an indeterminate number of those worlds? Um, moreover, given that on some coarser grain uh, decomposition of the quantum state, there will be fewer, fewer worlds than on a, um, some finer grain decomposition of the quantum state, then how fine grained is our description of the quantum state when we speak of the, only, uh, the one and only Everett world that we ourselves occupy? So I think the, the kind of standard response here is gonna, is gonna be that this isn't a well-formed question. So um, the claim that our own world is just one amongst the multitude is again, relative to the decomposition of the quantum state. So on a coarser grain description, our world is one of many and on a finer grain description, our world is one of many, many more. Um, so then it's a mistake to think that this world can be described as either one or 10 worlds. This world is an emergent entity, so it's not, that the emergent world that is decomposed, but it's rather worlds emerge from the decomposition of the quantum state. So for the same reason, then it's a mistake to speculate how fine grained the decomposition must be in order for this world to be kind of counted as it were. Um, even so, again, I still, I still think the kind of the problem still lingers. How do we kind of conceptualize our world, the world we see around us within a multiverse whose number is ostensibly sensitive to how fine-grained the quantum state is decomposed. Um, so this is kind of been recognized um, uh, by Desaji Barmani. Um, so he's kind of quick to highlight the interpretive method when, um, when taking elements of the decoherence model to represent effectively non-interfering worlds. So, Typically, we say that the cross diagonal terms represent the um, interference between worlds, and then the diagonals represent the worlds. Um, then the, the rapid diminishing of the coefficients of the cross diagonal terms represents the emergence of effectively non interfering worlds. So it then follows that if there are more worlds, there are more diagonal cross diagonal terms. And then, the context of um, Schrodinger's cat. Um, which will become important later, many more dead cats and alive cats, each corresponding to a particular world or a particular branch of the, the wave function. Um, but he suggests, given deco decoherence is a physical process from which patterns emerge from the fundamental quantum state, um, patterns are multiplied. And if the process is interpreted in this way, there's just no metaphysical sense to the idea um, of there being no such thing as the number of Everett branches or um, an indeterminate number of them. Um, so as I suggested earlier, the standard reply is that world count is dependent upon the choice of grain of the decoherence basis. So whilst the number of worlds is ill-defined, there are still worlds. Comparably, you might say the number of clouds in the sky is ill-defined, um, but there are still clouds in the sky. Um, but this, uh, according to Desaji Barmani, is a contentious slide from a metaphysical claim about what was really happening out there in the world to worry about definitions. 
Okay, and then he continues. If the Everettians are right, then branching is a real phenomenon. They are emergent patterns in the quantum wave function. How many, I do not know, but I do know that cats aren't the kind of things, the numbers of which can be indeterminate. There aren't half cats or two-third pie cats. If there are cats at all, there are a determinate number of them. Um, so I, I kind of think this is a bit confused. I don't think Ever Everettians are advocating this. I think they're saying that there's a finite number of worlds, but it's indeterminate which number. Um, this was also an opportunity to look up whether there are conjoined cats or Siamese twin cats, and in fact there are, so um, I guess make of that what you want. But um, the kind of conjoined cats aside, the, the main point I wish to, to focus on is this so-called contentious slide from a metaphysical claim, um, a claim about what's really happening out there in the world to worry about definitions. Um, there's an assumption here that I take to be of central importance. So. Um, there's a definite fact of the matter about how the world is, a metaphysical fact about what's really happening out there in the world, um, and a metaphysical fact which is over and above how the world is represented or described. So, um, to quote uh, Al again, um, <laughs> um, he has a kind of similar assumption, uh, at least in, in, in this passage, um, but with the kind of a, a, a crucial caveat in parentheses at the end. Um, so Al says, Wallace is in response to, or at least a comment on, on Wallace's choice of arbitrariness as a description for um, indeterminate world number. So Wallace prefers to say that it's not vague, but arbitrary how many worlds there are. Um, however, arbitrariness is in the primary sense of property of choices. If a choice is arbitrary, and it's up to us how we make it, but it's not in any coherent sense up to us how many ever worlds there are. And then this kind of crucial, um, caveat that will, will appear later. So it, it, may, it may in some sense be up to us what we mean by every world, but given any determination of what is to count as a world, it's not up to us how many such objects there are. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so now uh, with all that on the table, here's my um, proposal. So there are, as I see it, two representations at play in discussions of world number um, in, uh, in EQM. So when Wallace writes, our own world is just one amongst the multitude. On the one hand, there's a representation of our own world, a single effort world according to an embedded system of that particular world. Um, let's call this the uh, world or uh, imminent representation. And by imminent, I simply mean operating within an effort world um, as an embedded system of that world. Um, on the other hand, there's a representation of all worlds, what we typically refer to as the multiverse, uh, or with reference to Wallace's quote, the multitude of every um, worlds. What does I put here? The representation of all every worlds as presented to a hypothetical exogenous system. Um, one response here might be that there are other representations one can appeal to. Um, you might think that there's a representation of all worlds whilst indexed for a particular one, um, but the present for present purposes, I think I only require the two mentioned. So the first representation, this world or imminent representation, is I think in a kind of particular sense, kind of primary, um, which I'll aim to show. And it's due to this representation that we see tension generated between the single world we ourselves occupy and the indeterminate number of Everett worlds in the in the multiverse. Okay, so I, I suspect one reason why some authors find it difficult to accept that the number of worlds in EGRAM is indeterminate. Um, it's due to the, the tension generated from the fact that we are embedded systems of, of Everett worlds with the resources to represent an Everett world imminently. That is with the resources to represent an Everett world as an embedded system of that Everett world. So consider the number of clouds analogy once again. Um, when representing the number of clouds in the sky, the system doing the representing is positioned outside the system of inquiry and without the resources to generate an imminent representation of a cloud. So that is without the resources to generate a representation as, as an embedded system of a particular cloud. If it were possible to generate imminent representations of clouds, then I suggest that this may be uncomfortable, an uncomfortable additional resource for those who maintain the indeterminacy of cloud number, since the imminent representation itself seems to carry with it a particular demarcation of what constitutes a cloud. Um, so then we can just carry this over to, to EQM. 
So the world, um, or Im imminent world, that representation of an world is a representation that itself carries with it the notion that there's a particular demarcation of what constitutes an Everett world. The world representation is a representation that itself selects a particularly demarcated world object, since the, the system doing the, doing the representing is an embedded system within that representation. So it is by definition contained within the representation. Um, it therefore becomes difficult to represent an Everett world as anything other than that particularly demarcated object um, when employing the world representation or imminent representation since doing so affects the representation of one's place within it. So the determinacy of locutions such as this world or our world cited earlier is an artifact of this mode of representation, namely um, the world or imminent representation. Um, the multiverse representation on the other hand, um, I propose is a representation that results from the reification of the imminent representation. Um, so in other words, the, the world or the imminent mode of representation and that kind of determinacy with which it carries is, is reified at the level of the multiverse mode of representation. Um, but I think one should be careful here. So that the world representation and the multiverse representation are indeed compatible, but I think problems result when structures from one mode of representation get reified in the context of, of another. So recall that the determinacy of locutions such as our world represented as a particularly demarcated object is, I think, an artifact of the world or imminent uh, mode of representation. So the nature of this representation carries with it the notion that there's a particular demarcation of what constitutes an Everett world. The representation itself is tied to descriptions such as this world or our world, since the representations of one place within an Everett world is inextricably linked to the representation of that particular world. Um, so every worlds um, are represented. Uh, so yeah, sorry, so for those ever, for every worlds represented collectively as an indeterminate uh, multitude, as according to the multiverse representation, the system doing the representing is positioned exogenously. So the nature of this representation does not carry with it the notion that there is a particular demarcation of what constitutes an Everett world. And it's here where indeterminacy is able to gain a, uh, a foothold. Okay, so... Um, so I suggested earlier that um, some authors endorse, at least implicitly, the claim that there's a definite fact of the matter about how the world is, what is really happening out there in the world. Um, so to be clear, I don't think one should push against this claim um, to such an extent that one endorses any type of kind of anti-realist view. Um, it's not that I'm here denying that there's a definite fact of the matter about how the world is. But I do think there's reason to believe, as has hopefully been illuminated by some analysis so far, that the number of objects there are is inextricably linked to the representational resources we have available to us. So in other words, there's sense to be made Sorry, there is no sense to be made of a metaphysically significant demarcation of the world into constituents that is over and above how the world is represented. Um, so if you recall, Desarjee Barmani argued that comparing the number of Everett worlds with the number of clouds in the sky is a contentious slide from a metaphysical claim, a claim about what was really happening out there in the world, to a worry about definitions. Um, the statements... Um, such a statement appears to draw a clear distinction between the metaphysical, um, namely the definite fact of the matter about how the world really is, and then the definition of, so namely which structure our language actually picks out, um, however precise, when representing particular concepts. On such a view, there appears to be a metaphysically privileged demarcation of the world into constituents, and it is these constituents that make up the world's metaphysically privileged ontology. So if there really is a definite fact of the matter about how the world is, and that's a metaphysically privileged demarcation of the world into constituents, then it presumably follows that the concept of an Everett world is well-defined according to the purported metaphysical fact about how the world really is. Um, but I don't think it's clear that we can separate the question about what is really happening out there in the world from the resources we use to represent it. So in the Everettian picture, um, 
we have seen how the particular concept of an epic world typically used in discussion is inextricably tied to the world representation. So given we are part of the system we are representing um, when adopting a world or, or imminent representation, then any attempt to represent an Everett world as anything other than that, um, which is given by the representation, will affect the representation of one's place within it. So a world or imminent representation of Everett world cannot by definition refer to more than one world, since doing so requires additional systems that are doing the imminent representing. Um, as such, the apparent determinacy of the world around us, um, given by um, this world or our world, the one and only world, um, ends up being an artifact of this mode of representation. Um, okay, so remember the um, quote from Al um, earlier, that it may in some sense be up to us what we mean by every world, but given any determination of what is to count as a, as a world, it is not up to us how many such objects there are. So I think the crucial piece of this proposal, and one that I think is um, possibly kind of downplayed in the literature is the determination of what is to count as a world. So the problem here is that the determination of what is to count as a world is inextricably linked to the resources of each mode of representation. So when we represent worlds at the multiverse level, we don't encounter features of the thought presented by the world representation, namely the fact that the system doing the representing is part of the representation. So multiverse representations of Everett worlds when considered in isolation can kind of make claims in a in many ways analogous to the uh, the number of clouds in the sky, since at this level of representation, the, the kind of hypothetical system doing the representing is not part of the representation. The hypothetical system is exogenous. And so whenever worlds are represented according to this mode of representation, one can introduce notions of indeterminacy, since, there, since there's no obviously privileged demarcation of Everett worlds tied to that mode of representation. And then since there's no metaphysically privileged demarcation of Everett worlds under this mode of representation, it's not obvious which criteria one should employ to count the, uh, the number of worlds. So the, the kind of the tension between references to this world or the one and only Everett world that we ourselves um, occupy. And then and the indeterminacy of world numbers, tension generated from Illegitimately, illegitimately reifying one mode of representation in the context of the other. So the world representation and the multiverse representation are two modes of representation of a single structure, but the superimposition of these two representations leads one to inc incorrectly conclude that features inherent in one mode um, resurface in the other. So in our context here, so one illegitimately reifies features of the world representation that just has no place at the level of the multiverse representation. Um, the, um, the individuation of every world that is tied to the world representation or imminent representation is lost when considering all worlds um, together, namely the representation of all every worlds. Um, and when these two modes are, uh, are superimposed, we're led to believe there's tension between the indeterminacy of of world number on the uh, on the one hand, and then the determinacy of the world um, or imminent representation on the other. But I kind of suggest that this superimposition is, is flawed. So um, once one realizes that such determinacy is an artifact of the particular mode of representation, um, and that that particular feature has no place at the level of the multiverse representation, then I will, um, sorry, one will, I hope, realise that there is no reason to sort of um, to doubt the force of this apparent um, tension. Okay, so lastly, here's a general, um, I'm going to spell out a, a kind of hopefully quite promising framework that may accommodate the proposal of this paper. So um, this is the view expressed by Agustin Rayo quite recently. Um, So earlier I suggested the number of objects there are is inextricably linked to the representational resources that we have available to us. So uh, Rayo's thesis is situated in the debate concerning absolute generality, um, whether there's sense to be made of an absolutely general first order quantifier, um, a quantifier that can range over absolutely everything. Um, 
his proposal aims to push against the thesis that there's sent to be made in an all inclusive um, domain as intended by the absolutists. So he kind of proposes that the, the contents of the world are subject to some kind of open endedness. Um, that, that's the kind of context that's not um, especially relevant here, but one particular argument of interest um, starts with the notion of a distinction between ways for the world to be. So such distinctions are thought of as theoretical tools. Um, to be a little bit more specific, a distinction between ways for the world to be is a theoretical tool that helps us make sense of the world um, and can be adopted uh, or not on its ability to do so. And so whilst it may be true in its most strict literal sense that um, there are entities such as electrons or hydrogen atoms, um, the particular descriptions we use to identify the relevant feature of, of the world um, They have no kind of metaphysical significance in, in the sense that there's no single privileged description we attribute to those features of the world. The facts we attribute to those descriptions can be described using many different entirely separate sets of distinctions. So consider the fact that the world contains electrons. The distinction between there being an electron and there not being an electron is not a distinction inherent in the way the world is, which is independent of the representational practices used to describe such features. So rather, since the distinction um, between there being an electron and there not being an electron is so useful as a theoretical tool, it's therefore desirable to describe the world as containing electrons. So there's nothing about the world as it is in itself, independently of our representational resources, that settles whether the distinction between the world containing electrons and the world not containing electrons is objectively correct. Um, it's a distinction we find effective because of a combination of the way the world is and our psychological constitution. Um, and again, we can kind of carry this over to e EQM. So in the context of world number in, in, um, in Everett, the nature of an Everett world cannot be disentangled from the representational resources used to describe it. As such, the structure we pick out when representing an Everett world eminently is specific to that mode of representation and is not something that can be implemented in the context of another mode of representation, namely the multiverse representation in which all, all of these worlds come into view. So there's nothing about the world as it is in itself, independently of the representational resources um, used to identify those objects that settles whether the distinction between there being an Everett world and there not being an Everett world is objectively correct. Okay. Um, so I hope to have uh, articulated a reasonably novel explanation of uh, the indeterminacy of world number in EQM. Um, I think that the previous discussion of world number failed to address the tension between the claim that we inhabit a single Everett world, um, our world or this world, and the claim that there is no such thing as the number of worlds um, or an indeterminate number of Everett worlds. So I've, I've suggested that this tension is generated from illegitimately reifying one mode of representation of Everett Worlds in the context of another mode of representation. Um, and I suggested a, a general framework for the application of this view. Uh, 